Hey, Graceway, Pastor Tim here. Happy Easter to you. I'm excited for what I believe God's going to do on this celebration of Holy Week, this resurrection day, this day that we know that Jesus defeated sin and death and hell and offered to us forgiveness and freedom and life. And so, so glad to have you join us today, this morning. Um, I want to just ask two favors of you before we get going. Uh, Pastor Brandon, in the host moment, put in front of the opportunity to, to fill out a survey and, and put in front of us the, the topics, the series, uh, the, the campuses that you'd be interested in, Graceway, putting a, a, a church in, in that location, as well as prayer requests. I, I really want to ask you to please make sure that you fill out that survey, uh, whether it be right now, whether it be after the service, and get it back to us. We're believing that God is going to get us back to some normalcy. We're going to be able to do those series that we're excited about doing. We're believing that this thing, it's not going to kill the church. We're going to continue to be praying about where we're going to put campuses so that we can reach people far from God. And we want to know how to pray for you. We want to know what's going on. Uh, our staff continues to pray. We're continuing to receive prayer requests. If you are sick right now or have needs right now, our pastors are available to pray with you. But, but we want to be able to hear from you. And so would you fill out that survey and please get it back to us. The second thing that I want to ask you to do is I want to ask you to share this service. If you are watching on YouTube, it's right there. If you're watching on Facebook, it's right here. And if you're watching on visitgraceway.org, it's, it's up there. And let me tell you a quick story as to why I want you to do that. I got a call last week from, from a, a person who said, uh, man, my, I was watching your service and somebody that I went to high school with uh, was, uh, got online and was watching the service. Um, uh, we went to high school together and, and quickly after high school, God saved me. And, and I tried to give this person the gospel, and they really weren't interested at the time, so I'm really excited uh, that they were watching Graceway this morning at the same time that I was on. Let me tell you the thing that's interesting about that. Uh, neither of those individuals live in Kansas City. Neither of them attend Graceway on a regular basis, and both of them are in their 60s. And what I'm trying to say to you is that, is that this person who called me has been praying for this person for 40 years. And last week, that person, because they saw the link on somebody's social media, hopped on to our service and had an opportunity to hear from God's word. L let, me, let me encourage you, uh, as disappointed as I am that, that this room is empty right now, that we're not able to gather and sing praise to Jesus together and celebrate Resurrection Sunday, this is the truth of it. You have a greater opportunity, an easier opportunity now than you ever have. All you have to do is click one of those buttons, and, and you're going to have an opportunity to plant a seed uh, that might come to fruition 40 years from now, it's an exciting thing. And so would you do that for me? Would you fill out that survey? And would you make sure that you share the service? We've literally had thousands of people watching us every week, and we're trusting that God's gonna do more this Easter Sunday. Come on, somebody, all right? Let me pray for you, God. We love you today. We're excited to be together, even in this medium. Would you speak to us by your grace, through your spirit, for your glory and our joy? In Jesus' name, amen. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, if you have a Bible. I don't know if you're like me, but man, I feel like I need Easter more this year than maybe any other Easter. Um, this has been a challenging season for us as a church, as a city, as a country. Uh, we, we're experiencing a, a pandemic, and, and this is one of those times that that I feel like Easter, is, it's, it's more important for us to celebrate it. And so I want to encourage you to not just attend uh, this service and then get on with your day. I want you to do what you can to celebrate Easter uh, this, this, this Sunday, this Resurrection Day, whether that's a meal together, whether that's taking a walk with somebody, that's spending some time with God as a family. Just make sure that you lean into the celebration of the Resurrection Sunday uh, and experience what it has to offer you. But more than that, I want you to read Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, and, and it says this. This is Paul speaking to a church at Rome. He says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the de dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Here's what I want you to know. Easter is, it's a celebration, of course. Uh, it's not a gathering, although we enjoy the gathering element of it. Easter in the Bible is an experience. It's something to be experienced. 
Uh, It's something that God gives us, not just on a day, but day after day after day. Easter is that, that, that thing that offers us power in dead, dying, discouraged, hurting, broken places. That's what Easter addresses. Easter is the thing that closes the gap between what it could be and what it is, what I want it to be and what its actuality is, what, what I know it ought to be and what reality is. The space between those things, closing that gap is what we're celebrating today. It's Easter Sunday and what Jesus does on the cross and the power that's offered to us because of it. I wonder if you've ever thought about just this week that we've just celebrated, this holy week, and why Jesus came into Jerusalem the way that he did, and why Good Friday, and why three days in a tomb, and why God saw fit to do it that way. Why on a donkey? Why not in a Ford Mustang or a Lamborghini, right? Why not in a Bentley? That makes more sense to me. Why Good Friday? Why crucifixion? Why all the confusion and all the hurt? Why why three days? And, and Peter gives us an interesting perspective. In 1 Peter 2, verses 21, he says, For this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you. He left you an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. And so what I want to do today is I want, to, I want to walk you through the last three days of Holy Week. And I want to put in front of you my perspective, I think a biblical perspective of why God ordained it to happen that way and what God was doing in that, that day and what God wants to accomplish not only then but now so that we can experience the fullness of the resurrection, even in the midst of COVID-19, even in the displacement, even in the disappointment of not being together. The experience of Easter is as relevant, I'll be honest with you, maybe even more relevant for me uh, than than ever. And so I want to talk to you about Friday, about Saturday, and and I want to talk to you about Sunday. Uh, Friday, when you read through the biblical account, was was a day of pain. It it was a day, uh, it, it was a day that, that, in all, in all ways look like a loss in, 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 on God's side of, 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 the, of the equation. And, and yet, if you take a step back from Friday, I think it, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful day. And we celebrated Good Friday a couple, a couple days ago, and I hope that you were able to kind of experience the beauty, as it were, of, of the cross and of redemption and of forgiveness uh, but one of the most wonderful things to me that, that sounds odd is, is that I love the fact that Jesus experienced suffering. I love the fact that Jesus experienced pain. If you do kind of a chronological or an overview of religion, uh, Christianity is unique in this regard. You look through mythology and you see that the gods were kind of separate from humanity, separate from brokenness, separate from pain and suffering. Not so with Jesus. Jesus, uh, the message, the, the, the paraphrase by Eugene Peterson in the Bible says that Jesus moved into our neighborhood, that he became like one of us. The Bible says that he was tempted at all points, just like we were, and Jesus experienced the things that we experienced. He experienced, he experienced pain. On the cross, Jesus experienced physical pain, not, not only through his life, but specifically on the cross. And I want you to just think about this for a moment. Why did God choose to send Jesus in this time and in this way? I mean, if, 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 if God had chosen to send Jesus in the 2000s, 2010, and Jesus had experienced capital punishment, he would have experienced it by lethal injection, right? He would have had a good meal, and then he would have been taken into a room and laid on a bed and a needle put on his arm, and he would have, he would have fallen asleep, and it would have, to a large extent, physically, uh, he would have been exempt of the pain. But God chose to send Jesus in this time to this people in this way under an occupation of Rome that had perfected torture, had perfected political statements through pain and suffering. The Persians actually invented crucifixions and the Romans, they perfected it. And Jesus came into a time and into a space, uh, into a nationality and into a geography that capital punishment meant he was going to be crucified. Now why? Why? Because God wants you to know that, that he has experienced pain and that he's experienced suffering, that he's experienced loss, that he's experienced all of the things that we've experienced. And, and listen to me, please, that he chose to do it, that he volunteered to do it. When you look at the cross, you see Jesus choosing, volunteering to suffer pain so that you and I can know when we go through the valley, our shepherd has experienced that pain. 
Jesus experienced emotional pain. Isaiah 53 and verse 3 gives us the titles that, that have kind of stood the test of time when it comes to Jesus. And, and one of the most emphasized titles of Jesus in the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah calls him a man of sorrows. A man, a man of sorrows. Jesus, the creator of all things, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega, the, the word of God is the man of sorrows. He's experienced emotional pain. Jesus experienced the the scope of emotion in a way just like you and I have. Jesus experienced joy and frustration, anger, uh, happiness, exhaustion, disappointment, sadness, benevolence, compassion. He, he's experienced all of the things that you and I have experienced. He's experienced great days and, and terrible days. And I love the fact that whenever we look at the life of Jesus, we see that Jesus didn't exempt, exempt himself from the human experience. Jesus didn't exempt himself from displacement and, and loneliness and fear and anxiety. Jesus experienced those things that we, so that we could know that our leader, our God, our Savior has been there and done that and, and gone through that and knows how to lead us in goodness and grace and compassion to his purposes. Jesus experienced physical pain and emotional pain, and Jesus experienced relational pain. Jesus experienced relational pain. It's amazing to me. Jesus is born into a house to Joe and to Mary through miraculous, in a miraculous way, and he's the firstborn, but he's not the only. And the Bible says to us in John chapter 7 that Jesus grows up in a home and that his brothers never come to believe that he is who he says that he was. Now, I don't know how Jesus kind of exhibited his messianic claims to his family. I don't know if when he was trying to skip bath time, he would just walk on water. I don't know if, if whenever he wanted a toy, he just let it come to his hand like a Jedi. Like, I don't, I don't know any of those things that Jesus did, but I do know that Jesus lived a perfect life in front of his brothers and his sisters. I do know that there would have been enough there that if there was any type of optimistic, optimism or love uh, of his family for him, that they would have just gone along with it. The, John chapter 7 that says that they didn't believe him. Mark chapter 3 says that they actually told people that he was crazy. Now think about this. Jesus, the creator of Joe and Mary, the creator of his brothers and his sisters, James being one who we just... Saul eventually became a follower of Jesus and the leader of the church in Jerusalem. They were going around and Jesus had created them and loved them and knew that he was go coming to the earth to experience the, the, the human reality and then die for the sins of all man and the brokenness of the world and his own flesh and blood reject him. His own flesh and blood reject him. John chapter one says that he came into his own and his own did not receive him. Isaiah 53 again says that Jesus was acquainted with grief. Jesus, Jesus knew grief, knew all about grief, knew about suffering, knew about pain, knew about difficulty, knew about displacement and fear and worry and anxiety and rejection. Now, now why, why? Because Jesus wanted us to know what what Paul says in Romans 8 and verse 28. For we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. All things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. I, I remember some time ago I read about a pastor who was talking about just how glib and cliched this, this text was. And, 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 and I was astounded to see how profoundly he was missing the point. Jesus came into this earth and experienced pain and suffering to accomplish the purposes of God. When we look at the life of Jesus, we can believe Romans 8 and verse 28. When we look at the life of Jesus, you, you have to understand that it was the suffering of Jesus that saved you. Jesus didn't come and live an elitist life. Jesus didn't come and live a luxurious life. Jesus didn't come and live a privileged life. Jesus came and lived the life that you and I live and suffered and hurt and tried to orient himself to the plans and purposes of the Father in the same way that we're called to do it so that we could see that there was a purpose to the pain of Jesus and there's a purpose to your pain. There's a purpose to your pain that, maybe we could say it this way, there is no pain that the purposes of God cannot redeem. There's no pain that the purposes of God cannot redeem. You say, how could you possibly know that? Because of Good Friday. Because of this day of pain, that, that's how I know that, that, that God actually used the pain of his only beloved son to save you and I to save you and I. Now let me, let me be clear, that, that's God's plan. He, here's the enemy's plan. The enemy wants you to get stuck in pain. 
The enemy wants you to get stuck in emotional pain, relational pain, physical pain. The enemy wants those things to become your reality. Listen, the enemy wants in this season of COVID-19 where we're quarantined, when we're afraid, when people are losing their jobs, when the economy's a wreck, he wants that pain to become your reality instead of you to take a step back from it through the lens of Good Friday and say, what are the purposes that God has for me in this season? What are the things that God's trying to teach me in the season? What are the things that God's trying to accomplish, not just in me, but in our church, not just in me, but in our family, not just in me, but in our city, not just in our city, but in our country, not just in our country, but in the world. What is God trying to do? Because anytime there's pain, there's a purpose. There's no such thing as purposeless pain in the Bible. And, and we see that preeminently on Friday. We see that preeminently on Friday, if you want the resurrection experience, I want to I want to say to you, freedom from those things is available. It's not. Let me be clear. It's not that your circumstance is going to change, but it is that your perspective can change. It is that your understanding of the purpose for it can change. It is that there's power available to you that's greater than your pain, greater than your regret, greater than your wish it hadn't, wish it didn't, wish it would stop. There, there's power that's available to you in the midst of it because of Friday. Now, Saturday is is an interesting day. Saturday is a a day of confusion. It's a day of confusion. I want you to imagine the disciples, right? Now, we have the benefit of hindsight, and so we read through uh, the Gospels, and we see Jesus saying in many different ways, hey, hey, fellas, there's going to come a day where, where I'm going to have to lay my life down, and three days later, I'm going to rise back up again, and, and we're going to be good. But it's very clear also with the benefit of hindsight that the disciples didn't really understand exactly what Jesus meant and certainly didn't understand that it was going to feel that way. And before we judge the disciples too harshly, how many of you have had times that God has told you something? I got you, baby. I'm going to use this for your good. I'm going to accomplish things through this way that you couldn't get any other way. And if you'll just hang with me through this valley of the shadow of death, I'm going to walk you to the other side of that mountain. And, and I promise you, you're not going to want to do it again, but you're not going to be bummed out that it happened. How many, how many times have we had God say something to us and we don't exactly understand and we didn't know that it was going to feel that way? I mean, I've had that happen many, many, many times that I, I have questions, questions in my life about why did it have to go that way? Man, why did it have to feel that way? Why, why, why couldn't you have chosen a different way to do it? We, we've got a bunch of whys, a bunch of questions in our life, don't we? I, I, man, I certainly do. Uh, you know, let me, let me give you some. Uh, eyebrows, are they, are they facial hair? I, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's a question that I have, right? I mean, for somebody that doesn't have any hair, I'm, I'm hoping that I get to count these, but I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I mean it's, a, it's an unanswered question for me, Right? Uh, let me give you another one. Is it, is it illegal to park beside a fire hydrant if your car's on fire? I don't know. I don't know. The, if you've ever had your car burst into flames beside a fire hydrant, I'd, I'd love for you to send me a text, socially distanced, of course, but uh, send me a text, send me an email, and let me, let me know. Uh, why do feet smell and noses run? Important question. I, I, I don't know. Uh, you, you've heard people say it's the best thing since sliced bread. Well, what was the thing before sliced bread? All right, well, apparently we'll never know because we're, we're at the peak, right? Uh, uh, sliced bread's the greatest thing. Or uh, he, here's another one. If, if, if pro and con are opposites, wouldn't the opposite of progress be Congress? Maybe, maybe, yeah. I mean, we probably do. We, we have, that's actually not a question. That's, that's a fact. We get that one. Okay, okay. A- anyways, uh, let, let me give you some other ones. Um, hey, God, do you hear me? God, do you hear me in the midst of this? God, God, are you near in the midst of this? God, why aren't you helping in the midst of this? God, why aren't you fixing this? God, why didn't you heal them? God, you knew, you knew what we needed. Why didn't you provide it? God, you knew what we were asking. Why didn't you speak up? God, we, we have... We have questions. I have questions. Uh, you know, God saved me when I was 16 years old. I'm, I'm 42 now. And, and God has been incredibly faithful over these many years. I, I wouldn't trade my relationship with him or the journey that he's had me on for anything. But, but listen, there are times and experiences that were outside of my control that I wish had gone differently. 
and that I don't know why God, who I know is powerful and I know is good, didn't, didn't alter the course of events. There are, there are seasons of confusion in our life. Listen, we're living in one right now, aren't we? We're living in, in a season right now, and the worst part of confusion is waiting. It, it, it is for me. Like, it's not just that I don't know, it's that I'm afraid I might never know. And, and it's interesting, when I, when I take a, a look at, uh, at the Bible, when I take a look at the experience of the disciples, I, I, I have to acknowledge that the times that I'm the most confused, it's not really that I don't have the answers, it's that I forget what God has said or I didn't understand it was going to feel this way. Remember, the disciples had all the information they, they needed to stay faithful in this three-day period, but, but they, they forgot and they begin to doubt they begin to doubt. The disciples, when Jesus dies, they don't, they don't stand up in boldness and proclaim that would, man, they hide. They, they self-quarantine. And, and they huddle together. And, and, and you can imagine the conversations. Man, what are we going to do now? Man, apparently we're wrong. Apparently we misunderstood. Apparently, uh, and, and there's confusion and there's fear and there's anxiety about what they don't know and what's coming next. And why didn't God... Why didn't God do what he said he was going to do? Uh, you know, you got, you got guys like John and James in the room, and you got my favorite, Peter, in the room, who, Peter, Peter, I love Peter, because, I, man, I understand Peter, don't you? Peter, Peter is impetuous, and Peter is opinionated, and, and, and Peter uh, talks when he should be quiet, right? And, and maybe my second favorite is a guy by the name of, of Thomas, and Thomas is, is the cynic, um, and I want you to imagine that the disciples are huddled in a room, right? And, and that Jesus comes to them through the wall, right? Jesus appears in the midst of them and the majority of the people in the room immediately have this, this sacred moment where, where their faith is realized and where their doubts are squelched, but not, not Thomas. Jesus has just come through the wall and, G and Thomas is like, man, no, 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 I, I, need, I need more than this, right? I need more than you just coming through the wall with some kind of hoaxy magic trick. I, I, I need to have a flesh and blood experience. And I love that in the context of Thomas's doubt, Jesus doesn't reprimand him. In the context of Thomas's confusion, Jesus doesn't rebuke him. Jesus just says, here it is, Tom. And the thing that I love, how many of you know that if Jesus puts his hands out, you probably should not try to put your fingers in the holes? How many of you know that that's the point where Thomas is like, you know what, I'm good, but, but not my man Tom. Tom takes his fingers and digs them in to our Savior's palms and then asks to see his side. <laughs> Like, okay, that's good, but could I also see your feet and also see your side? And Jesus does not say, you are the dumbest. You, you, are, you and your stupid self, for the rest of time, you're going to be known as stupid doubting Thomas. Jesus never comes to us in our confusion with rebuke. Jesus comes to us with his presence. Jesus comes to us with his presence. You know, whenever we're in a season of confusion, a season of fear, a season of anxiety, we forget what God says, we doubt, and we begin to feel alone. The disciples, they isolate. This is the reason that right now on this Easter Sunday, I just want to encourage you, don't, even if you're quarantined, even if you're displaced, and I know that you're at home, make sure you're reaching out. Because the enemy comes to us in our fears and our doubts and our isolation, and he, and he wants to... to fan those things into flame that in the midst of fear, reach out to the people of God. But when we're alone, we're doubting, man, we want to give up. Peter, Peter comes to a spot, um, even after Jesus has been resurrected, John 21, and, and we see that, that, that Peter is ashamed of what he's done and ashamed that he's, he's betrayed Jesus, not, not once, but, but three times. And, and we find Peter fishing. And Jesus comes to where Peter is fishing and he yells out, are you catching anything? Now listen, Jesus isn't really asking how the fishing is that day. He's asking, is it working for you, Pete? Is this new, Peter didn't, wasn't just going to blow off some steam. Peter was going back to his old life. He'd given up. And Jesus comes to him in his given up, giving up, in his confusion, in his isolation, in his doubt, and in his fear. And he makes himself available in the midst of that 
confusion. Psalm 73, verses 16 and 17, the worship leader of King David, his name was Asaph, says this, but when I thought to understand this, whatever it is, what, what's the thing right now that you're like, man, I just would love you to tell me what the deal is with this, God. When I thought to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. How many of you are tired of watching the news? How many of you are tired of another politician talking about COVID or another doctor, another stat or another trajectory or another this much? When I thought to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. Listen, until I went into the sanctuary of God and then I discerned their end. Can I tell you, uh, last night, the COVID thing got really personal for the Dunn family. Uh, I had a family member who had to go to the hospital and they had to administer a test to, to her and, and she's at an age and, and has some respiratory issues. And, and I had a, a moment of full blown panic. I'll be entirely honest with you. It's an amazing thing whenever this COVID thing started. It was, it was over there and it was them. And it, it has just kind of slowly come to our shores and slowly come into our lives and now feels like it's dictating so many different. And, and I'll, be, I'll be honest with you, man, I'm, I'm exhausted of talking about it. I'm exhausted of not seeing y'all, worshiping with y'all. I, 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 I hate not being able to celebrate Easter with you this way. I mean, as intellectually as I can process, it's, it's more than a celebration. It's more than a gathering. It's an experience. It's, I, yes, I, I know all of those things, but I, I got that news. I got that phone call and I grabbed my coat and I went out and I was walking down the street and I was, I was asking people to pray. And, and, and then how many know you're asking people to pray and it doesn't really help you? <laughs> and so I tried to do what I've asked you to do. I tried to ask you to get into the presence of God. And so I pulled out my phone and I, I put on some of the songs that were, we sang some of the songs that we sang today. And, and can I tell you, there's no confusion that the presence of God can't come. I mean, I, I've experienced this so many times. It, it doesn't change your circumstance, but when I invite God into the room with me, changes the room. When I invite God into my confusion and into my doubt and into my fear, doesn't change that I'm afraid. Doesn't change that I'm concerned. Doesn't change that the news is what it is. It just changes who's with me and what they can do about it. There's no confusion that the presence of God cannot come. Now, please listen to me. Don't confuse hope with answers. Don't confuse hope with answers because just like the enemy wants to get you stuck in your pain, the enemy wants to get you stuck on your whys. The enemy wants to get you stuck on why is this happening? Why did God let this happen? Why didn't God do something? I, I know people who their perspective of God is stuck on a why. Can I tell you, your why ain't gonna help you. It's not gonna help you because it's not about your why, it's about your who. Who's in the room with you? Who are you following? Who are you believing? Who's bigger than it? Who's got you? Who's with you? Your why is not going to help you. The enemy's lying to you. Why is, why is COVID happening? Listen, I don't know. The question is, is God with you? The question is, is God speaking to you? The question is, does God have a purpose for it? This question is, is God going to see us through this and be faithful to us in the midst of it? There is no chaos, no confusion that the presence of God cannot calm. And so if you want to experience Easter, listen, you got you to get into the presence of God today through prayer, through worship, through his word, by getting on the FaceTime or Zoom or Google Meet or whatever you use to be with God's people. You gotta invite God into the spaces that you need him the most desperately. Friday is the day of pain. Sunday is the day of confusion, or Saturday is the day of confusion. Sunday, <laughs> Sunday is the day of resurrection. Christianity is the only religion that bases its entire faith around one person and one day. If you study religion, there, there are typically lots of people in lots of days. Not, not so for Christianity. We base our entire faith on one dude, his name is Jesus, and on one day, this day. Resurrection. Listen, my faith is not contingent on a day of pain. It's not contingent on Friday. My, my faith is not contingent on clarity and assurity around the spots that I'm, that I'm confused. My faith is tied to this day, to Sunday, to the day of resurrection. And the reality of it is you might be watching this right now 
And it might be Friday in your life. It might be Friday. You might be experiencing pain and, and, and you might be experiencing loss and physical pain, emotional pain, really, I, any, any kind of pain. It might be Saturday in your life. You might be experiencing fear and anxiety and worry and confusion and doubt and isolation. But here's the thing that I want you to understand about our faith. Because it's contingent on one person, it's because it's contingent on one day. A new life, a changed life, a changed perspective is just one sunset away. Just one day away, just one decision away. So many times in the church, we make this far too complicated. You want to change your life, you got to make one decision. You want to change your path, you got to make one decision. You want to change your perspective, you got to make one decision. You got to make 10 decisions. You don't got to go all get cleaned up and do this and that and, and get yourself ready for it. You just have to make one decision to turn around. One decision to believe again. One decision to change your perspective. One decision to invite somebody else into the room with you. It's an amazing thing about our faith. There's a, another resurrection story in the Bible. It's a story of a guy by the name of Lazarus, who the Bible says that was a good friend of Jesus. And Lazarus, he got sick. And Lazarus had family members who knew Jesus, and, and they sent a text to Jesus, and they say, hey, hey Jesus, Lazarus is sick. Um, it's not looking good. If you could just come and do whatever it is you do, right? Change the water into wine and rub some stuff on his forehead and, you know, say whatever you got to say and just heal him, that'd be awesome. And Jesus is like, yeah, 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 I'll be there soon. And he doesn't come. <laughs> he doesn't come. And, and, and they send another text and they DM him and they hit him up on Twitter and they TikTok him and they, you know, like, hey, seriously, Lazarus is going to die if you don't do something. And Jesus, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll be there. And, and Jesus waits. And Lazarus dies. And they, they send messages to Jesus and they say, I, I don't know why he didn't come, but, but your friend is dead. And it'd be great if you would come and pay your respects. And Jesus says, yeah, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll be there. And Jesus doesn't come. Jesus doesn't come for the first day. Jesus doesn't come for the second day. And just imagine what's happening in the hearts and the minds of Lazarus' family. Jesus doesn't come for the third day. Jesus shows up on the fourth day. And he gets out of the truck. He's got a big gulp in his hand. He's just like, hey, what's going on, guys? And can you imagine the rage? Can you imagine the, the disdain? Can you imagine the sense of disrespect? Can you imagine how, how badly Martha and Mary wanted to give Jesus uh, more than a piece of their mind? And they come up to Jesus in, in shock and disbelief. You've got to understand that in the Jewish culture, it was the fourth day that the human soul left the body. This was like there's no point of return. And so when they talk about, they talk about he's actually dead and we can't open it, he's going to stink. What they're saying is there's no, there's no reconciliation for you not showing up, Jesus. Nothing can be done. And in John 11, verses 25 through 26, Jesus says to her, now watch, this is, this is my version of it. Jesus sets his big gulp down, <laughs> walks her a little bit off to the side and says real calmly to her, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And then I think he gets real close to her and says, do you believe this? Do you believe that that is who I, who I am? Do you believe that I can do this? Do you believe that this is true about me? Do you believe that there was a purpose to the reason that I didn't come? Do you believe that I can do something miraculous? Can I tell you, if you want to experience resurrection, the enemy wants to get you stuck in your pains and your whys, but if, but if you want resurrection, you got to know Jesus. This isn't about a theology. This isn't about, this isn't about a, a, a behavior. This is about who you know and who you're trusting. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and life. Do you believe this? Do, do you believe this, that there's no death, that the power of God cannot resurrect? 
Do you believe that no matter what you've done in your past, that God can resurrect it? Do you believe that he's the resurrection and the life? Do you believe that that relationship that is deader than a doornail, right? You said for better and worse, you didn't know it was only going to be worse. Do you believe that God can resurrect that? Do you believe that God can resurrect your joy and your hope and your purpose? Do you, do you believe that just that sense of melancholy and worthlessness, and, and it's not that anything is necessarily broken, it's just that nothing is necessarily good. Do you believe that Jesus is the answer to that? Listen, if you want to experience, if you want to experience Easter, it's really not about what you're going to have for lunch. It's not about you getting to come to a building and sing songs and, and hear a sermon. It's about whether or not you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. It's about whether or not you believe that, that God changes any room that he walks into. It's whether or not you believe that no matter what it's been, that God can make all things new. The enemy wants to keep you stuck. He wants to keep you stuck in bondage. He wants to keep you stuck without freedom. He wants to keep you stuck without forgiveness. Jesus wants to save you and set you free. That's the story of Easter. That's the reason that we celebrate it. Easter is something that you can experience today. Listen, I wish that we were in the room together. But the truth is, you don't need to be in this room to experience what Jesus has for you. I want you to look at that worship guide that we provided for you online there. There's a couple responses that I'd love for you to consider here today. A couple things that I'd love for you to consider about your relationship with God and whether or not you have one, whether or not you're open to one. There's actually a really simple A, B, C, D response. I'm going to start at D. I want to walk you down through it. I want to ask you, just take 10 seconds, say, God, would you talk to me? In these next 10 seconds, would you tell me not only who you are, but who I am? So here it is. D, I, 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 if this is true about you, I want you to check this box. I want you to be bold, all right? I don't ever plan to have a relationship with Jesus. And if that's you, man, I want to thank you for your candor. I want to thank you for your boldness. I want to thank you for your honesty and I want you to know that we're going to be praying for you. I want you to know because we believe that God has better things for you than anyone else. I want you to believe that God has freedom and forgiveness and joy that you can't find in the room with anybody else, that he is the resurrection life. But if that's where you are, I want you to check that. C, I'm open. I'm open to what you're saying, Tim. I just need more time to think about this. If that's you, then I want you to check that box. And I want, you, I want to ask you to ask God this simple question. God, if you're real, would you show me? Would you show me who you are? Would you show me what's true? Would you let me see if you really have good things for me? And if you check C, man, we want to thank you. We want to thank you for your honesty, and we want to thank you for your can. I want you to know we're going to be praying for you. B is I already have a relationship with Jesus. Now, church people, listen, for some reason, we, we think that this is the boringest answer, but this is the greatest answer, that God has already saved me that God has already given his grace to me, that God has already turned on my lights, that I once was blind and now I see, I once was crippled, but now I walk, I once was in bondage, but now I'm free. That's what Easter is all about. And so if that's true about you, man, I want you to put a, a, a bold X beside that B, and I want you to put an X there in gratitude at the grace of God. And then lastly is A, and A is I'm accepting or recommitting my life to Jesus today that this is a day that I, I want to come back. I want to make one decision. I'm going to make one decision to give my life back to God or to give my life to God for the very first time. And if that's you, I want to lead you in a prayer right now. It's a simple prayer. There's, there's nothing complicated about faith. I want you to understand that. Faith is just simply accepting what I don't understand because I know that God does understand. And so here's what I want, I want you to, to do. I want you to, if, if you're checking A, I want you to, to pray this prayer. God, I know. God, I know who I am. God, I know what I've done. God, I know that I'm a sinner. God, I know that I need a Savior. God, I know that I can't do it on my own. God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry that I've tried to save myself. God, I'm sorry that I've done it my way. God, I'm sorry for the damage that I've created. God, I'm sorry for the regrets that I have. God, I confess that you are true, even in the spaces that I don't understand. I confess that you can save me. I confess 
that you are the resurrection and the life. I confess that you change any room that you walk into. God, I tell you today that I believe that. And God, I surrender. God, I still have questions. God, I still have doubts. God, I still have needs. God, my circumstance is still what it is, but to the best of my ability, I give it to you. I give it to you today. And I ask you, God, to take care of it and to take care of me, not only in the here and now, but for all eternity. God, I trust you with my salvation. I trust you with my life. I give you my will and I ask you to save me. And the Bible says that if we'll call out on God, that he will save us. It's one decision. I want to thank you today for joining us on this Easter Sunday, man. I, I miss you. I miss you, but I'm, I'm believing that God has good things for you. Amen. I'm believing that God wants to set you free right there in the midst of displacement. Amen. I'm believing that God can be with you and speak to you and do incredible and miraculous things even in the midst of this journey. And I'm excited because even though we're not going to be together on Easter Sunday, I'm telling you, we're going to be together soon. And when we do, we're going to celebrate what God's done on this Easter and on all the days in between. And I promise you that in the midst of this, God has a purpose for it and for you and for us, for his glory and for our joy. I love you. Let me pray for you. God, we love you today. And in the midst of everything that's going on, the fears that we have, the anxieties that we have, the worry that we have, God, we say that you are greater. We say that you are the resurrection and the life. We say that we believe this and that we invite you into all the places that we need you, the places that we know and the places that we don't. For those of us, God, who have celebrated Resurrection Sunday, you have saved us, God. We thank you. We thank you for your grace and your power in our life. For those of us, God, who are still considering, God, would you speak to us? Would you show yourself to us? For those of us, God, who are saying right now we're not interested, God, I pray that you'll soften the hearts and open the minds and show yourself profoundly good and gracious and kind, even in the midst of our rejection of you. And for those, God, who are saying, I'm making a decision today, we thank you. We thank you for your grace to them and your grace to us. We celebrate, God, what you're doing, even in the midst of this crisis, in the midst of this disease. We tell you that you're good and that you're faithful and that you're kind and that there's no other God that we would rather serve. You are the victor. You are alive and well, and you are doing what only you can do to bring about your purposes in this time and in this place. Let it be done in we, your people, for your glory and our joy. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you, and I'll see you soon. Thank you for celebrating Easter with us. I know this is a new and unique way of worshiping together, and we are grateful you are choosing to join us. If you would like to pray with a pastor, please don't hesitate to call us at the number below. One of our pastors would love to set up a time to speak with you, either by phone or video chat. In addition, we have great resources available for pre-K to preteen students at visitgraceway.org. We also want to encourage you to follow us on Facebook and Instagram. This is a great way to stay connected and join us on our 21 days of prayer as we seek God on behalf of our community, city, and world. Thank you for your continued generosity in supporting our ministry here at Graceway. If you are a regular part of our church family and want to give or just desire to worship through giving, it can be done online at visitgraceway.org give. We want you to be a part of planning our upcoming sermon series at Graceway. If you text SURVEY to the number on the screen below, you will receive a response with a link to the survey. We appreciate your help. We hope that today's service was a blessing to you. If you haven't filled out our online Easter response card, please text the word EASTER to the number below. We hope you and your loved ones have a wonderful time today celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. We are already looking forward to worshiping with you again next Sunday. See you then.